the vow, the apostle, and the haircut. Hello, everyone. My name is Al Person. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church or in the comments below. That first one is my email address, pastor at mascot.church. I hope you enjoy these videos. If you like them, like, share, and subscribe, please, and who knows uh, who might join us. Today, I'm going to be presenting a theory. Now, the theory may not be correct. I don't know who else holds this theory, so I'm going to tell you right when I get to the, to the theory portion, this is my theory. Even if you completely dislike the theory that I end up with, you will have an opportunity to look at some scriptures that I'm pretty sure most of my audience has not taken the time to study. And so what that should do is help us to lift the lid just a little bit more on the wonderful thing that is the Word of God, and uh, perhaps we can get some deeper and more and greater understanding. I hope, the, um, uh, I hope this blesses you. Now, I don't ever do any after-the-fact editing on my videos, so sometimes I'll misspeak and I think, do I go back and fix this? I don't know. Sometimes the video that you see is the second or the third cut, or maybe more, because I didn't like the first cut. It is easier for me to recut than to attempt to go back and to edit. Why? Well, because editing is time-consuming, takes a lot of effort. I can do it. I have done it, but it just takes a lot of effort. And I have, um, uh, I'm a husband. I've got a family. I've got uh, children and grandchildren, a church to run, a book to finish writing, and a business to run, and two new business projects underway. So I don't really have a lot of time uh, to do stuff, you know, extra stuff. What is my theory? Well, there is a vow in the Bible called the Nazarite vow. I will have to read a bit of scripture, but I'll put it up on the screen because I'm pretty sure if we've, if we've read it, we've read it over pretty quickly, okay? And so this is going to take a moment, but it's worth doing. So allow me to just pop this up on the screen for you and follow along. I'll read it quickly, but it is really very valuable to my topic here. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them whether when either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink. He shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes, fresh or dried all the days of his separation. He shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. He shall let the locks of his hair, uh, of hair of his head grow long. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body, not even up for his father or for his mother, for brother or sister. If they die, he shall make himself unclean because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy to the Lord. If any man dies very suddenly beside him and he defiles his consecrated head, then he shall shave his head on the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day he shall shave it. On the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves or two pigeons to the priest to the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and shall make atonement for him because he sinned by reason of the dead body. And he shall consecrate his head... The sa that same day and separate himself to the Lord for the days of his separation and bring a male lamb a year old for a guilt offering but the previous period shall be void because his separation was defiled and this is the law for the Nazarite when the time of his separation has been completed, he shall be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and he shall bring his gift to the Lord. And then it goes on, it talks about the various sacrifices here. He shall bring his gift to the Lord, one male lamb a year old without, a blem without blemish for a burnt offering, one ewe lamb a year old without blemish for a, as a sin offering, and one ram without blemish as a peace offering, and a basket of unleavened bread, loaves of fine flour mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and their grain offering, and their drink offerings, and the priest shall bring them before the Lord and offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram as a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord and the basket of, with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall offer also its grain offering and its drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head at the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall take the hair from his consecrated head and put it
it on the fire that is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. And the priest shall take the shoulder of the ram when it is boiled, and one unleavened loaf of, out of the basket, and one unleavened wafer, and shall put them in the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved the hair of his consecration. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. They are a holy portion for the priest, together with the breast that is waved and the thigh that is con uh, contributed. And after that, the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite. But if he vows an offering to the Lord above his Nazarite vow, as he can afford, in exact accordance with the vow that he takes, then he shall then he shall do in addition to the law of the Nazarite. That is from the book of Numbers, chapter 6. So there you go, and the English Standard Version. That's a very interesting passage. This is a particular vow that the uh, Nazarite would take. Now, who is a Nazarite? Well, someone in ancient Israel, like you or like me, male or female, would take this vow and they'd consecrate themselves to the service of the Lord. Now, what I do not know and I have not read and I haven't had the time to look up is whether or not a woman would shave her head after a vow. I don't think so. I think this does apply to men. One of the things that is important, several things that are important in this vow is during the vow, nothing from the grape, nothing that comes from the grape must be consumed. And that's really interesting and really critical. Now, why this is critical is because the vow has to do with the honor and the theological purity of Israel. And of course, the vine and the grapevine is, is a type of Israel. Israel is reflected in the vine. So no vinegar, no grape seeds, no grape skins, nothing can be consumed. Also, the hair of the Nazarite must grow. If the Nazarite is, um, the Nazarite vow can be interrupted for only one reason or for one fundamental reason that's listed here, and that would be exposure to a dead body. So if the Nazarite is functioning and then someone in the working and then someone in the field drops dead next to him, he has to shave his hair and start his vow again. Okay, this is critical to the rest of our story. This is very important. At the end of the vow, the Nazarite brings an offering to the priest, which is a composite or a combination of all the various offerings that Israel has. He brings it to the priest. The priest sacrifices, makes the, um, that offering. He does the appropriate things with it. And the Nazarite also takes the hair that he's cut off, and that's burned as well. It's a sign of consecration. So it's really quite an interesting, interesting thing that happens. A Nazarite can also make a vow in excess of what the law requires. In other words, he could vow property or he could vow um, some resource that he had, whatever that seems to be. There are some examples of people who kept the Nazarite vow in scripture. It, it looks like um, Samuel, Samson, and John the Baptist, the most likely for certain would have been Samuel, but um, I'm sorry, Samson, but very likely Samuel and John the Baptist also, and there are others. Now you say, well, Al, you've got a theory, you better get to work at this. Well, this was in the old law of Moses, the book of uh, Numbers, way back when. So in the, in the old law of Moses. Now, my theory has a little bit to do with something or a lot to do with something that happened afterwards. From here, we're going to go to the, um, the book of Acts and to something that the apostle Paul did. This is the place where we'll, from where we will get our theory. So let's just pop in here and um, get going into the book of Acts. After this, Paul stayed many days longer. Where am I reading from? Uh, Acts 18, 18 to 21. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Sencre, I think Sencre is the correct pronunciation here, so that's what I'm going to use, or Kencrea, but I think it would be Sentry, so we'll just leave it there. At Sentre, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. Uh huh. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. Okay, so we have Paul in this place cutting his hair because he's under a vow. Now, here's where the, here's where the first part of the conflict or the questions begin. Now, it's not a conflict 
in, in terms of enough to sp split theologians down the middle and have them you know, throw, <laughs> throwing rocks at one another. No, but there are differences of opinion. Some say, well, we don't know what kind of vow Paul was under. Others say, it looks like Paul was under a Nazarite vow, but how do we know Paul had finished the vow? It doesn't seem to make sense that he finished the vow. Some commentators say, well, it looks like Paul may not have finished the vow. But no one who holds to the position that this was a Nazarite vow that Paul took offers a possible reason for Paul cutting his hair then. I'm going to offer that. That's my theory. Okay, the Apostle Paul is preaching, he's ministering, he's cut his hair. It looks like he's under some kind of vow. The only thing that could interrupt a vow would be if Paul is in touch with a dead body. Herein lies the problem. We don't read of Paul contacting a dead body. Now, the other thing about the Nazarite passage, which is so interesting to me, is why it's, it even gets so much play in the book of Numbers anyways. It's a large portion of Scripture. If it wasn't that vow, why would the Scripture even use the word vow later on without saying it was a different kind of vow? It just, it just seems to constantly be calling out Nazarite vow here. Paul could have interrupted the vow, cut his hair, not had to go to Jerusalem to burn the last of his hair, his locks, if he was in touch with a dead body. I'm going to propose that Paul was in touch with a dead or at least dying body and that he cut his hair for the purpose of demonstrating to his audience what was going on, and that the primary audience who would get this demonstration were Jews, but secondarily were Gentiles, were non-Jews, to whom he would explain the Old Testament types and the shadows. Okay? Now, in order to do this, I'm going to have to identify who the dead body was that Paul was in touch with. For this, we're going to continue on in the scriptures, and we're going to look at something that the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 28 of his prophecy. I'm going to put these on the screen. Here we go. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, who rule this people in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not com come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid the foundation, who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line, and hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and waters will overcome the shelter. I am going to have to read this last little bit. It's important here. Then your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through it, you will be beaten down by it. Okay, this is a ripper of a passage. But the prophet says to Israel, Old Covenant Israel, who had rejected Christ, because remember, it's, it talks about the cornerstone down below, so he's looking forward. He said, you have made a covenant with death. You've made a covenant with death, and the way that it will be annulled is when you come to Christ, or if you choose to come to Christ. And this is really, really fascinating in this passage. Now, let me take you to the prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ, but I'll quote them first and then, and then um, we'll look at a reference and then we'll wrap this up because really all I'm going for is just this element of my theory here. And we'll see that we can, and we'll see if my theory makes any sense. When the Lord prophesied about the coming destruction of Jerusalem, he said something to this effect depending on the translation. Where the body is, there will the eagles gather. Or, will the, or where the corpse is, there will the vultures gather. Now that's really interesting. I'm going to put that up on the screen for a moment, but I'm also going to put its Old Testament source on the screen first. And you're going to see something else, and then we'll, um, we'll go on. So let me pop this up on the screen here. 
in Isaiah, Hosea, so Hosea and Isaiah were contemporaries, but they're different men, different prophets. I, Hosea 8, 1 to 3, I almost did it again. <laughs> Set the trumpet to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord. Because they've transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. To me they cry, my God, we, Israel, know you. Israel has spurned the good. The enemy shall pursue him. Okay, that's Hosea 8, 1 to 3. Now listen to the Lord's prophecy about the fall of Jerusalem in Matthew 24. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, I like to keep these videos down to that 15 to 20 minute mark because of, um, well, it's, it's a, uh, kind of a place that I'm at, um, you know, in terms of uh, length, but also our attention span, but if I keep it nice and sharp, then you can say, ah, just got it, just like that. I shouldn't make small talk like that because it eats into my 20 minutes, should I? Okay, in Hosea, the scripture talks about the vulture being over the house of God because Israel had fallen. Now, vultures do not, carrion falcons and vultures and that, do not attack living beings. They wait till the living being has died, and then they go after the corpse, and you see this kind of from the book of Matthew. Jesus, in prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem, now he does this in Luke, uh, what's the same passage, in Luke 21 and in Matthew 24. He talks about this specifically. He says, and let me read Jesus' passage again. I won't put it up on the screen. He says, for as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there will the vultures gather, or there the vultures will gather. The Lord is saying that the body of Israel, who had rejected him, was dead, was spiritually dead. It was a corpse. It was no longer alive to God. Now we've looked at the spiritual blindness in our Isaiah 6 passage, and we've seen that. Now that does not apply today, because that old covenant Israel, that old world, is gone. It was destroyed in AD 70. So there's no deadness that applies specifically to the Jews today anymore, as some would like to say. But no, that's not true. But certainly in those days, they had uh, crucified the prophets, they had crucified the Lord, and great judgment was coming on them. Now there are many other passages that talk about Israel as a dead body at that time that God would revise. You, you see the, uh, and, and also in earlier places where Israel was, um, if you will, out of covenant protection and seen as dead. You see that in the Valley of the Dry Bones and so on. I really didn't want to spend a huge amount of time developing that, but if you want me to develop that further, let me know. I'll pop it on the schedule of videos to do at a later time. So the Apostle Paul is, has cut his hair because he's been in touch with a dead body or a dying body. He's doing it. This is Al's theory. Al's theory here. And then we're going to look at one more verse from the book of Acts that leads into this. He's doing this to demonstrate to his Gentile audience who were in the area that, listen, God is done with old covenant Israel. I've cut my hair. I've touched a dead body. What a great object lesson. And he's doing it to the Jews who would know this from their own law. Now, the passage that we read about Paul cutting his hair appears down in, um, in, uh, that, in the book, down in the chapter, but earlier on there's something that's very interesting that Paul says that further supports my theory. This is from Acts 18. So the previous chapter, a passage was later in Acts 18, earlier on in Acts 18, and remember the chapters are not divided by God, they're divided by men, but previous to this we read what I'm now going to put up on the screen. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that, that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. 
Okay, so just a quick exegesis of this passage. Paul was occupied with the word testifying to the Christ, to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus, and when they opposed and reviled Christ, or when they opposed and reviled Paul. So as they reviled one, they reviled the other, okay? So some chapters, uh, translations actually say when they opposed and reviled or blasphemed Christ. So the implication in verse 6 is that by opposing Paul and reviling him, they were opposing and blaspheming Christ. I think you can read it each way equally because Paul was the Lord's shaliach. He was the Lord's man as the man himself he spoke, okay? So what does Paul say to them? He says that he shook out his garments, which is a sign of rejection. Um, you're being rejected. And uh, there are connections to that you find about uh, wiping the du- uh, banging the dust off your feet or shaking out your garments. Then he said, your blood be on your own heads. In other words, the judgment that is coming is your fault. You're being judged yourself for your sins, okay? And the term your blood would not refer to a... a punishment like a, a, an imprisonment, but an execution, a death. You will die as a result of your own sin. Paul said, I'm innocent. From now, I will go on to the Gentiles. And then just a while later, we find that Paul shaves his head. So back to, or he cuts his hair. So back to Al's theory as we wrap this up, and then my challenge to you. If you like this video, like, share, and subscribe. I think you know about that anyways. The point that I'd like to challenge you with here is whether or not my theory makes sense. Does it? Even if it doesn't, I'm pretty much convinced that um, uh, most people I know have never tried to put all these passages together. I know that because I'm of the reading in theological circles. There's not a lot of connections here, so I'd imagine most of my audience hasn't. Now, would I die a terrible death or cry unquenchable tears if my theory was proven to be wrong? No, it's just a theory. And, um, and that's the good bit about it. So I'm not stomping my foot and banging my fist on the table saying, you've got to believe this. This is the only way to interpret that passage. No, it's a theory. Nevertheless, as a tool, it will already have helped some of us, un- some of us understand those passages. I hope that you are blessed by this today. I enjoyed this study so much. I learned so much about the Leverite vow, about the ministry of Paul, and the possibility that my theory might just be right. Hey, if you know anybody else who preaches the same thing, contact me. Let me know. I think some have. I might have read their stuff and just missed it. My name is Al Persson. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church or in the comments below. God bless you. We will talk soon.